Welcome to the Dashboard Effect Podcast. I'm Rick Thompson, and today I've got with me a special guest, Greg Brown, one of our account executives here at Blue Margin, who recently uh, gave a presentation at a Lunch and Learn that I was part of in Denver, and I thought it would be interesting today to go over a lot of the topic that he covered. So welcome, Greg. Yeah. Hey, Brick. Good to be with you. Yeah, yeah. So the main theme of the Lunch and Learn was how to prepare your data for AI. Uh, obviously, it's almost become a cliche now, the, uh, the saying that uh, data is the new oil. Uh, Microsoft, I think on one of their slides at, at Build, uh, they said something like data is the fuel that powers AI and so on. So why don't we talk through a little bit about some of the considerations at a high level of the things that you need to do to be able to extract the most value from, from AI from your data or with AI from your data? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's interesting, the the foundational layer of this, I think, might seem a little boring or simplistic to folks. But what we consistently find with our clients and in our work is that companies are not taking enough steps and really taking enough care to prepare their data for AI and really, I would say, to position it for AI. And so, you know, the talk that I gave and, and I think what we'll discuss today is much less focused on specific AI tools or workflows or ways that you can leverage a technology and much more about the foundation and what you need to have in place to really enable actual value from any of those outputs. And so the one common thread that I think we see really across the board with our clients and in the market generally is that companies have historically not invested in the technology and the platforms to be able to position and organize and prepare their data for AI. And in some cases, that could be a result of companies generally underutilizing data across the analytic spectrum. In other cases, it could be that they simply haven't had the technology and, and the talent internally to be really to know what to do to set the right foundation for yeah. AI. So that's what we were really focused on in this talk. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, you did start off the talk talking about something interesting to me, which is this trough of disillusionment concept. Yeah. Do you want to talk right. about that for a sec? Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, full disclaimer, we at Blue Margin don't actually know if we are in sort of a trough of disillusionment when it comes to AI. But this came from an Economist article that I had read a couple of months ago now. And it came from a survey uh, from S&P talking to companies that had really invested in generative AI. And the stat was that they were seeing a, a pretty significant uptick this year in those companies abandoning their Gen AI pilots yeah. compared to last year uh, because they simply weren't seeing the value from the AI outputs and so have, you know, understandably reined in spending from that. And so that stat was kind of taken to, to suggest maybe we are getting into the trough of disillusionment with AI. But I think the key takeaway is that for anyone that's aware of Gartner's hype cycle, we don't stay there forever. I mean, right. after that is the plateau of productivity when we really start to see traction with the technology. So our message on that is, well, we don't really know if we're there. Even if we are there, it's not going to stay like that forever. It, it, if anything suggests a certain window of opportunity that companies have to really start doing the foundational things with their data to prepare for AI. Yeah, yeah. So that trough of disillusionment, I can I can relate to that in AI. I'm I'm you know, really excited about AI and all the things it can help us do. And I use it a lot every day, LLMs, to help my personal productivity. And we use it in coding and various things here in the company. But I know there's been a feeling for months like something around AI agents are just going to take over and actually be like employees and be able to do full jobs. And it hasn't quite panned out that way yet. And so I think people are saying, oh, maybe this is a bust. I think the reality is that, you know, the technology may not quite be there yet or the implementations aren't quite perfectly done yet. So we're sort of in that that trough where you're saying, ah, this doesn't look that good, but then it's going to sort of climb out of that as we figure out the use cases that are super useful. There's obviously a lot of obvious ones, but I think there are going to be some that are major. Yeah, and I think it opens up a window of opportunity for companies to learn um, from other companies and where the investments haven't made sense. I mean, there's been some notable examples of customers really pushing back against AI agents or AI customer service, to put it generally, which has allowed some companies to learn, well, hey, we can't fully automate that or we risk the most important thing, which is our customer base and revenue. And so right. I think it's given other companies that have been slower to invest a, a bit more to learn from and to understand from other companies' experimentations. Um, but none, again, none of it suggests that you shouldn't be thinking about this and preparing your data. Um, if anything, maybe just some lessons to learn from and some ways to think about how you apply it in your business. Exactly. So you're in the trough of disillusionment, maybe 
maybe you're not, but in general, there may be some of that going on according to Gartner. And so it may be tempting to say, okay, so I don't really need to spend time getting my data in order because I don't know what the ROI is going mm. to be with AI, but it's coming fast. So why don't we talk a little bit about um, the, the, you know, sort of the right model for getting your data ready for AI. Yeah. I mean, the single most important consideration is, is what kind of platform are we staging our data in? And when we talk about that, we use that term kind of colloquially, but what we mean is a data lake house platform, which, yeah. you know, we talked about on the podcast, many listeners are aware, but is really the modern evolution of a data warehouse that positions your data for AI and machine learning, but also positions it for a lot of other use cases. And that's why we see it really practical uh, a very practical step for a lot of companies that honestly probably have opportunities to improve descriptive reporting, data access in general, and visibility into data, and the ability to have self-service on data. And so there's yeah. a number of different use cases that that Lakehouse model starts to enable for companies. And one of them is preparing data for AI, but it's not solely about that. And so that's why we see it as such a, a sort of reasonable suggestion for a lot of companies that have otherwise been dealing with a lot of silos of data yeah. from different ERP systems. They've been trying to do direct connections to systems. They really haven't had a staging area and a platform to bring together raw data and to organize it, um, which can help with so many other areas of analytics, but also be one of the most practical foundational things to really get ready for AI. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll put your slide up here on the screen uh, for those of you watching the video, but uh, as you say, if you have a, a well-built data lake house, it can contribute to all sorts of functionality and you know, machine learning, um, general AI, LLMs, AI agents, self-service ad, ad hoc analytics, as you were talking about, dashboards can feed your FP&A system. It's not just building a data lake house so that you can have some kind of RAG system for your LLMs, but it it helps with so many other things. So maybe describe a little bit about the architecture of a, of a lake house, because I think uh, most people are familiar with the term uh, uh, data warehouse. Um, over the last five or six years, we've migrated to using a data lake house because of a lot of uh, uh, flexibility it gives you and efficiencies and so on. But maybe describe a little bit for our listeners. Yeah, I mean, to keep it high level, and, and I think the flexibility is key there, Brick, it, 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 the lake foundation is really important because it accepts all types of data. So we think oftentimes of structured data, um, tables and columns and rows, but organizations increasingly are creating way more and capturing way more unstructured data, which could be something like customer reviews on a website or survey forms. It could also be images and, and video files and so on and so forth. So the lake itself is a flexible place to store all types of data for the organization. And then on top of that is more of the traditional data warehouse functionality that we're used to where we're using SQL Server, um, in our case, serverless SQL, um, so it's easy to maintain. But that's where we can process and really extract value from structured data and start to build definition around it, um, which enables things like self-service and dashboarding. But all the while, that raw data and all types of data is preserved in the data lake. Yeah. And that's important because let's say a data scientist comes in and wants to do something with Gen AI or even more traditional predictive analytics and machine learning. They're not going to want to work with structured data that started to be cleansed and, and manipulated as we would normally do with dashboarding. They instead want to work with the raw data set, which is preserved at that bottom layer of the architecture in the data lake. So that's really why organizations are seeing it as, hey, this provides everything that traditional enterprise data warehouses did, but it fits our business and where data is going. You know, I can't think of the stat right now, but it was something like, you know, 70% of the new data that businesses create is actually unstructured data. Interesting. And so to have a data platform like a warehouse that can only take in structured data is potentially leaving a ton of value on the table and data that you can't capture. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of the architecture at a high level and yeah. why we endorse it. That's a good, good description. I love that. The, uh, the layer of serverless SQL that you're talking about um, allows you on structured data to put uh, what you'd think of as SQL views on top of the data that's in the data lake so that analysts can use SQL or Power BI or Excel or whatever to extract the data. And then the stuff that's unstructured, your data scientists can go in and do their magic. So that layer, that serverless SQL view that, that we do, there's other ways of doing it, um, is often referred to as a semantic layer or semantic model. Um, why don't you talk about that for just a second? Yeah, you know, it, to keep that reasonable and simple, you know, it's basically a layer that provides business meaning and definition to the data. And 
The example I used um, recently was concerning the system J.D. Edwards, and I'm sure there's someone out there listening that has dealt with this system before. And, <laughs> and if so, they know that on the back end of that system are very cryptic table names. Uh, a customer table might be like F7-2004 or something like that. Really, it's a customer table. And so when you think about importing data from source systems into a lake and building that semantic layer in SQL, you are giving definition and meaning to what this data actually represents for your business. And it extends much further than simple table names and into metric definitions and how we define success in our business. But you're allowing there to be a layer of translation that allows humans to understand where is this data and what does it represent? But then, of course, it also allows AI agents in the future to navigate that data, which is really key because if they can't navigate it and we can't trust that they're finding the right data sets to draw on for their analysis, then we, of course, can't trust the outputs and the whole initiative or value creation is a bust. Um, so that's why we see the, the building of a semantic layer is so important. Um, something that definitely takes time, but can pay dividends, not only in terms of humans accessing data, but really driving value from AI with data as well. Yeah. Okay. So I want to put a graphic up now that's a, a pyramid that sh sh sort of shows how you build towards meaningful ROI with your data in AI. So, yeah. So maybe yeah. describe this. Yeah. At the bottom, you know, is the, is the foundational step that we've been talking about, the investment in the right sort of modern data platform and the centralization of data sources and streams of data, wherever those may come from, uh, systems and, and otherwise. From there, it's the definition around the data, the building of the semantic layer, uh, imbuing that raw data with meaning so that we can understand and AI agents can understand. We would argue here at Blue Margin that only at that point on that second rung of the ladder or pyramid here that you actually get to a point of being able to put outputs on top of that. Now, those could be off the shelf AI tools that we're now plugging into a trusted data set. It could be our own AI tools and workflows that we develop internally um, that we get from Azure services, for example, and, and plug into data. But the key is that we can trust it and the organization around us can start to trust what they are getting from AI. And we would, of course, at the top only argue that at that point, would you actually see meaningful value creation, which we always, I mean, at least I always like to define rather simplistically. We're either showing that an AI agent or tool increased our revenue or helped us control costs or helped us mitigate a potentially very expensive risk. If we can't show that direct line to the financial benefit, we can't really argue that we're creating value with AI. And that gets back to the stat earlier and why a lot of organizations are pulling back when the board of directors says, well, hey, this is really fancy and it seems to work and I don't understand half of it. What is it doing to our bottom line? If you can't yeah. answer that question, you can't assure future funding and, and you really can't point to something that's having a transformative effect on the business. Yeah. So we, we offer this as a practical way to step yourself towards real value creation with AI. Yeah, so you get your data house in order, your data lake house, get your semantic layers. I think people sometimes make the mistake of thinking, okay, I'm just going to point an LLM at that and I'm going to get value. Mm. Um, and in fact, I was talking to another CEO this morning who said um, that rather than just try to layer AI on top of everything and assume that I'll get something good out of it, we're trying to look at specific problems or needles we're trying to move in the business and trying to figure out, all right, can AI help us with that? It's sort of a, a different approach. But either way, and I don't recommend the first way, the the second way is, is probably more economical. You're still going to need that data to be able to implement whatever you're going to try with that. It, and it makes sense. It's the fuel for AI. So, yeah. I mean, it's an obvious point. But the next point that maybe isn't as obvious, um, at least some of the, the companies and the folks that we're is, is really the idea of positioning it appropriately and preparing it appropriately. We all know that we need it. Sometimes there's a gap in understanding how to position it. And, yep. and that's what we really try to drive to. The other point there too, Brick, and we touched on this a little bit in the talk is AI is not a panacea. You know, we don't believe that. We, we think it's a partner and a precision tool. But if you don't really understand, and in your example, I think that was great because if you don't understand and think through how we're applying AI along our value chain and all the different processes for marketing, sales, and value delivery and value creation, um, then we might just take a scattershot approach and find out afterwards and a lot of money and time that we're really not creating value with yeah. it. And so it starts with a deep understanding of the business. And sometimes that's the harder part, understanding where we fit it in to be a partner. Yeah. Um, much harder sometimes than the actual technology around developing right. the AI. So you can't just turn on or turn your LLM loose on your data lake house and know that you're going to get something. It's not not a panacea. Yeah. It's more of a partner to help you solve problems. Yeah, yeah exactly. I like that. That's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. 
All right, Greg, that's all the time we got. That was great recap. I, I appreciate it and look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be on. All Thanks, right. Greg.